Hey, Susan Flory with you with The Big Middle. Sincerely wishing you well, sending you virtual hugs. This episode is virus light once again. This is not only because I'm finally seeing the back of a tiresome head-cold-flu combo. No cough, no fever, so it seems not COVID. But because the lockdown universe is heaving with shows on how to cope, how to distract, how to produce more at home than you ever did at the office. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not dissing the many purveyors of lockdown lifestyle advice. Much of it is good to excellent and surely necessary, but enough already is my feeling, confirmed by a straw poll of friends and family. We each have our own way of adapting to this global trauma, and there's plenty of good stuff out there. Since my cold meant I had to stop doing shopping runs for high-risk neighbors, I quickly slipped back into my news junkie ways, Yeah, incessantly scrolling, falling down bottomless Twitter tunnels for hours. My trusted news sources, Reuters, the BBC, the New York Times, the FT, the Guardian, the Economist, Next Avenue, Channel 4 News, are covering so well every conceivable angle. The facts, first-person accounts, sidebars, explainers, roundups of all the remarkable stories of kindness displacing selfishness. Bar the corona and ageism show I'm going to start working up now that I'm feeling better, I don't see a coverage gap that needs filling by the big middle. Anxiety levels are being driven up by virus news overload. Instead of this rush to displacement activities, more busy, busy, hurry, hurry, but now indoors and online instead of out there in the world we shut down, surely, alongside the explosion of lockdown advice, We need to make time to process what's happening, to sit with it, to just be instead of engage in what feels like competitive lockdown hyperproduction and self-optimization. This invisible menace presents a real opportunity to check our behavior, to figure out how we can sustain the remarkable displays of selflessness we're seeing, to figure out how we can live in a kinder, gentler, more equitable, more compassionate way. For the foreseeable, surreal future, there will be no shortage of existential questions without clear answers. Future episodes of this podcast will focus on some of these questions. To this week's guest, Dr. Linda Freed is a renowned geriatrician, epidemiologist, and dean of the Malman School of Public Health at Columbia University. I was thrilled to speak with her for the Longevity Forum at their flagship event here in London last November. Dr. Freed's message then is even more pertinent now. The longevity revolution, she says, presents us with the design opportunity of the century. Here's that interview. Hello. Hi, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, it sure is. What a forum, huh? Fabulous. Uh, An exciting group, very diverse, experts from so many different sectors, all with their eye on one big question. Yeah, it was really rich brain food. The panels, the keynotes. Now, you are hot off your keynote, your keynote address, getting a lot of play on social media. It was titled, Realizing the Opportunities of Longer Lives. Much needs to happen in a comprehensive, coordinated way to reap an equitable longevity dividend. You know, we don't have global central planners. How do we get people thinking healthy longevity is a burning issue on a par with the destruction of the planet? So in my mind, there are two things that change everything else for all of us. One, in fact, is climate change, which affects all of us and will escalate in its impact. And the other is the longevity we've created, which has been described in gloom and doom terms, but in fact is the consequence of a hundred years of intentional societal investment to keep children from dying in childhood, to keep women from dying in childbirth, to keep all of us from dying from infectious diseases. And the product of all those investments is that we've done something unprecedented in human history. Unprecedented. We've added 30 years to human life expectancy. Now, the question is, what do we do with that longevity? It's mind-blowing. Especially when you frame it like that. Because the average person walking past this wonderful building, we're at the Royal Institution, uh, the home of science in the heart of Mayfair, and most of the people would just say, oh, what are you on about? They really wouldn't think beyond the narrative of, oh, I don't want to be old. I'm really dreading my next birthday. It's all so distasteful. Too few are embracing the incredible gift of our times. 
How do we change the narrative to a positive one? So I think that we have to change the narrative and, and the smooth way to begin to is to understand that what we now know about what aging can and could be is very different than what our fears anticipate. In fact, it's often the exact opposite. So our fears, very human fears, are about dying and about decrepitude. That's the most basic set of fears we were born with. But what we now know is that not only have we created 30 years of additional life, but we have inserted them essentially as a new stage of life that we never had before. And often when I teach students, undergraduates and graduate students about this, I say, well, do you want those 30 years that we've now created? And they're very smart. They say, it depends. Um, and then I ask them, what does it depend on? And they, smart ones, say, it depends whether I'm healthy or not. Because they understand that health, if we have it through those longer lives, is a key in the lock to unlock the opportunities of why we wanted longer lives in the first place. It's the only wealth that counts, really, Yes, isn't it? Also, we need to restructure the institutions out there. and That's by consensus, that's not happening quickly enough. So I think it's very exciting to understand what the science says. So the science says a number of things that are not our intuition. First of all, we have learned over the last 30 or so years that health is malleable. That actually, if we invest across the life course from the beginning of life to the oldest stages in prevention, essentially investing in someone's health futures as well as their present, that in fact people are likely to arrive at old age healthy and to stay healthy. That investment has a high return for the individual, it has a high return for their families, and it has a high return for society. But it demands new health systems where we are not just delivering medical care to care for people who are already sick, but we're delivering prevention and health promotion in many new and important ways to keep them from getting sick in the first place. How do we sell that, though, to the people who control the purse strings and make policy? Because it's not going to happen without coherent political will followed by action. So one of the ways that climate change and longevity have something in common, aside from the fact that certainly climate change may affect our longevity, is that they both are highly disruptive. We can't project from what we've done to the future we need. We actually have to imagine something different. And if we do, we have actually a huge opportunity to reap great rewards. On climate change, you know, the story is very clear. We have to protect human health and well-being while we change the way we um, use and consume energy and what co energy we consume, along with many other things. On longevity, the, we can't project from the health systems that we have built to what people need. And we can use the evidence we know. But one thing we know is that investing in prevention across the life course for every age and stage has a huge economic return on investment. People don't get sick, they don't get obese, they don't develop hypertension or diabetes. They all across the life course, they're things they don't get, which saves money, perhaps not in two years, but in four and six years, yes. All of these complex problems were we're confronted with, and these two are prime examples, require a longer view and a commitment to understanding that there's some things each sector has to be responsible to deliver that are transformative and use the knowledge we now have which we didn't have 30 years ago. This is the period of OK Boomer. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of people trying to whip up intergenerational conflict. How do we stop that in its tracks? Or do we just toss it off and say, oh, it's always been like that. We, we boomers created the generation gap. So I'm part of that age group, so I take this quite seriously. Um, our young people need older people to stand up and be with them. 
Why do they need that? Because each age group has different assets to bring to the table to, to understand and solve complex problems, but we need each other. Um, and, and we all need each other both for the facts of it, but also for the emotional and psychological needs of it. Generations need each other. They need to be aligned. They need to uh, share. They value what each other brings. Life is richer if we do it together, and we can't do it solo. And, and young people need older people to provide the assets that they hold. And a lot of this resentment, which you're hearing in OK Boomer, is understandable when they don't see this older generation stepping up to their generational responsibilities. That's a fair ask by young people, but it's because we need each other. And it's because we're living in an age of incredible embedded age segregation. We don't mix anymore, naturally. Right. Aside from, you know, London is a walking city. Yeah, you might see someone older and younger on the bus. But in your day-to-day -day life, in your friendship group, you know, we're not mixing it up the way we used to. So we need to roll things back so that the social fabric looks the way it used to. So you're exactly right. The data are that we in the West are the most age segregated society that's ever lived in the history of the world. And, um, and in a lot of ways, it creates a kind of intergenerational loneliness that I think hurts. Uh, old people, older people feel a responsibility to leave the world better than they found it for those behind them. That is a deep age stage need but they also need to have the, the way to accomplish it, which sometimes is not clear. Young people need the, the partnership and the cohesion of a family structure and community structures in which they both have intimate, everybody needs intimate relationships, but we need networks of friends as well as families across generations. And we also need to share the public space together. And some of what I hear in the OK Boomer cry is how are we going to engage on our collective actions together with a shared commitment for a better future? How indeed? I mean, have you got, let's say, a three-ingredient recipe? This is what you teach, this is what you study, this is your area of expertise. So I think we're all still learning how to do this. We have a life stage that we never had before. I think about this as the design opportunity of the 21st century, <laughs> to design a new life stage. And we need to imagine together what would be valuable. But I can tell you a little bit about what we've learned. Um, people need, as they get older, to have ways to deliver things that they think are important and of value, that leave a legacy and secure a world better than they found it. It's very important for that life stage. The challenge often is that as people retire, they discover that the West hasn't yet built a last third of life that enables meaning and purpose for many people. And many people find that they have no role. In fact, older age has been described as a roleless role and no reason to get up in the morning. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Ageism consigns people to uselessness. If you're not economically productive, even though you might be willing, if you've been sidelined by ageism, good luck. Right. But it, that's absolutely true, and we have to tackle that. But I think we also need to value um, that the proposition of young people and old people is not an either-or proposition. We need to understand um, what each other's needs are, but also the assets you bring to the table. And I think it's relatively new science that's enabled us to see that as people get older, they have immense assets that we never imagined before. In fact, you could think of older people as the world's only increasing natural resource. Yes. Um, but bringing assets not just of a lifetime of experience, uh, accrued knowledge, uh, rich networks who could be drawn on, but also, actually, the ability that develops with more years of subjective and object experience and knowledge of being able to recognize both problems that are complex and that are important. 
the ability to tolerate the complexity after a lifetime of experience of handling complexity, and to hang in there if it matters, and to break it down into solutions. And then to feel the time urgency of the short number of years you have left to live to get it done. That's an asset that we've never had before that older people in our society now bring. If they're healthy, if they are not disabled, and we create the societal institutions and roles through which they can use those assets for the greater good, then the ways that we see productivity from the older generation will expand So the value proposition will be different. We will change the value proposition um, in ways we never imagined before, but in ways every age group will benefit from and which will lead young people to aspire to the opportunities of getting older. The thing is, the societal narrative is so negative. It's dread, and when you age, you get older, it's decline, decline, decline. And then you're going to be drooling in a corner, and who's going to take care of you? And it's, it's a big ask to get people to think otherwise. So that's a stereotype. What we have learned is that that stereotype is not the norm. So I think it's very important that any society that's humane take care of people who have needs and that we evolve the ways we do it to do it better. But at the same time, I think our societal will will to, to accomplish what it makes a humane society will be increased if we recognize what we didn't know before, that there are huge opportunities for all of us to have longer lives and that we are accomplishing for many, but not all people, increased health span that is approaching life expectancy. That means that people are arriving, at least subgroups of the population, are arriving at older age healthy, and then they're tracked to stay healthy. And the amount of people with increased health span is increasing. Now that's cause for great optimism, because if people have health and function, then the value of older age is there. Well, you issued in your keynote a rallying cry, let's call it, for the unlocking of what you labeled a third demographic dividend. Tell me more about this. So I think the evidence indicates that what we previously or to the present have conceived as the opportunities and assets of longer lives, which come under a demographer's heading of the second demographic dividend, are leaving a lot on the table. The second demographic dividend has been about the fact that over the last 50 years in the West, young people have been surviving into middle age and then older age and constituting a productive workforce. And the demographers and economists also say that with longer lives, the big asset is that people save longer. But the evidence is that that's only the beginning of the assets in the story that we have already or that we could have if we designed for the 21st century for a life of longer lives. And if we did that with by both investing in increasing everybody's health span to approximate their life expectancy and then having unlocked the opportunity for health, we built new roles and responsibilities for older adults to bring value to society and meaning to their lives and greater health because they're engaged, then we have the potential to do something we never imagined before, which I have been calling creating a third demographic dividend. That's the goal and that's the dream, isn't it? Um, But Well, we know governments always, there's structural lag when it comes to changing things. How do we actually make it happen? I mean, that's the $64 million question because we can talk, 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 talk about it, but what are the small steps, the incremental changes to actually get societal structures, you know, thinking about big business embracing the older worker, thinking about the education model changing so that, I don't know, everybody gets, Singapore's just brought in a learning allowance. What if we had portable benefits, lifelong learning allowances, good ideas, but how do we get them into policy? So I think the questions you're asking are are the second stage of what we need to do. The first stage is to imagine a third demographic dividend. 
the opportunities of longer lives and what we want in that. Then let's ask the questions. If we have something we never had before, we can't build what we currently have better and get there. So how do we t all together in every sector of society figure out what kinds of steps forward leaps each sector needs to make to both create health, which is an all sector enterprise, create health span, and then build out the roles and opportunities of meaning, purpose, and productivity that people want as they get older, that leave them engaged and contributing and connected. If we were to meet again in 2030, I'd say, what are you amazed about now that's happened in the last decade? What do you think you might answer to that question? Well, if we do it right, I know Britain has been, the United Kingdom has been very focused on the issue of loneliness. Loneliness, to my mind, is one of the 21st century social determinants of health, and it is socially constructed. We have designed in loneliness. If we take the longevity challenge, if we invest in healthy longevity and building a third demographic dividend, where all ages gain from the fact that we have longer lives, we actually, in 2030, will have designed out loneliness. A full redesign that manages to eliminate loneliness. That's fantastic. Dr. Linda Free, Dean of the Malman School of Public Health at Columbia University. I'm Susan Florey at the second annual Longevity Forum in London. That's the last of the forum interviews I'll share on The Big Middle. Head to thelongevityforum.com for more interviews with Forum founders Andrew J. Scott, Dafina Grapsi penny and Jim Mellon, with Dr. Charles Alessi, Senior Advisor to Public Health England, with longevity venture capitalist Laura Deming, with superstar biogerontologist Aubrey de Grey, and Julia Randall-Khan, the Founder-CEO of Encore Fellows UK. I've already shared Drs. Nir Barzilai and Professor Lynn Cox. Many thanks for tuning in and for your reviews on Apple Podcasts and my website, susanflory.com. Love hearing from you. Ageism and the virus coming your way as soon as I can manage it. Take very good care. Be well. Bye for now.